we've also invited uh, uh, Channing uh, Arendt. He's the Environment and Production Technology Division uh, Head or Director for the International Food Policy Research Institute. I know Channing from before because he worked in South Africa on the carbon tax, uh, has done a lot of work on the African continent, actually on the climate and development nexus, and he's also looked at things like food security and so on. And he's well versed not uh, only to, to speak about these issues in a broad way, but to also give insights from his research uh, on the African continent. Channing is uh, actually uh, participating from the US. It just shows his dedication. It's uh, I think like 3.30 a.m. in the morning there. Uh, and he's really taken the time and effort to, to be here and want to thank him tremendously for that. Uh, thank you, Channing. Over to you. OK, uh, thank you very much, uh, Salim. Uh, and I'm really happy to be here. It's a, it's a little bit early, but uh, it's, it's actually easier than flying all the way out to, uh, to, to, to Cape Town. So, so this, is, this is quite nice. Um, I'm going to go and look uh, internationally at uh, uh, what's been happening and then, and then bring it into to Africa. Uh, so, so here is just you know one thing that's that's happened uh, is a, a coal use in the in the United States, uh, and this runs to about 2008 2009 when the um, Copenhagen COP um, took place, and and you could see coal use in the U.S. just going up, uh, you know, regularly, uh, quite quite stable for uh, for a while, and uh, and then we have this Copenhagen COP, which famously failed. And, uh, and all the expectations were that, that coal use would continue to increase you know, sort of the trend lines that are, that are showing uh, there. And uh, what actually happened in the US is uh, that the coal use uh, went and, and has uh, dropped off um, dramatically. And there's a, there's a whole series of reasons for that. Um, but uh, uh, one of them is the renewables. And, and right now we're looking at, for the most recent data point uh, for uh, February 2020, is the, the lowest coal use in the United States in uh, more than 50 years. Uh, it's, it's the lowest data point in the, in the series that I can, that I can get. And uh, coal use is, is trending down. So things um, can and, and do change. And there's, like I said, a lot of factors factors behind the, the drop in coal consumption uh, in, the, in the US, but one of them is uh, the, the renewables. So this is the, the look at in the global sector uh, power generation, and uh, we've seen uh, increases. So in the past five years, uh, ener investment in energy generation has been about $250 billion, greater than $250 billion uh, each year for the past five years. And, and every year that uh, is buying more power because the, the, the price of renewables is, is dropping. So last year, 2000, the last year for which we have data, I think it's 2018, uh, more than two thirds of, of total new installed net generation was uh, wind or mainly wind and, and solar. Uh, so there's been a huge move uh, in uh, solar uh, generation globally. Now, a lot of this happening in China um, and in, in the developed world, and it's starting to happen in, in Africa as well. Uh, so if we look, and this is uh, one of my, my favorite graphs, and uh, one of the reasons that, that we can be quite optimistic about, about solar power in Africa is just the, the, the level of resource. Uh, there's, there's just a lot of sun on the African continent. And, uh, and, and we can see it here. So this is a picture for, for South Africa and its comparison with, uh, with Germany. And according to this data set, the, uh, the very worst place in South Africa for uh, the worst possible site for solar generation in South Africa is better than the best possible site for solar generation in Germany. I mean, that, yes. So, uh, you know, the, the difference in resource is, is enormous. We spoke about, you know, Carlos and others spoke about our oil reserves, or the oil reserves in Africa, uh, but there's also a, a solar endowment that is, that is really remarkable and far, far better than, for example, what you would find uh, in Germany. And this is one of the reasons why when, when we're working on the electricity system for South Africa, 
these days, we, we really think that uh, renewables, a combination of wind and solar, is, is the cheapest possible source for generation uh, for South Africa um, and, and by extension for, for much, of the, much of the continent at all use levels. And this is happening both because of the, the solar resource. In South Africa, we also have excellent um, wind resources. And uh, the, one of the big advantages, so the red on the left-hand side for South Africa is the, the qual high quality uh, wind resources. And, and one of the big advantages of South African wind resources is that they're distributed around the country. And South Africa has a, a pretty good um, electricity distribution grid. And so uh, the distribution of the wind resources means because it's likely to be windy uh, somewhere, uh, the average power output, if you distribute your, your wind turbines around the country, is, is relatively stable. And, and you get to a, a sort of a portfolio effect of, uh, of generation. Uh, and this is one of the factors that, uh, that makes, uh, you know, uh, renewable energy such a, an attractive option for South Africa over the, over the coming years. Uh, so if we look in, and continue that point, uh, 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 some opportunities, and I think we've already mentioned uh, uh, regional um, issues and, and regional trade. Um, and if we extend out and look beyond South Africa, uh, you know, the, if you can distribute your generation assets, your wind and your solar across space, so across more space into Namibia, Angola, um, uh, Zambia, and, and so forth, then you're going to get an, an even um, broader uh, generation effect and, uh, and you know, it's likely to be windy and or sunny somewhere. And so you get a, a, a more stable uh, power output. Um, the, the other big opportunity in Southern Africa for sure, and also on the Nile and, and elsewhere, is to use existing hydropower or new hydropower to load balance. Um, typically with hydropower, you just run the turbines all the time. Uh, but you don't have to do it that way. Uh, in many places now, in order to load balance, so if, if, if is you turn turbines off when the wind is blowing and the sun is shining, so you're, you have a lot of renewable energy assets that are generating a lot of electricity and you don't need the electricity, and water basically piles up behind the dam, and you turn them on when the wind is not blowing and the sun is not shining and, and you need the, the electricity. Um, you have to respect uh, environmental flow constraints, but again, if you have a large grid, uh, then you can turn turbines on and off on, on different dams and, and, uh, and, you, and keep the, the impacts on flow uh, to, to a minimum. So this is, these are some real opportunities that exist, I, I think, in the, in the region, on the Zambezi and, and in the Nile to uh, generate the electricity that, that would uh, uh, drive some of the at, at low prices that would drive some of the industrialization that that Carlos uh, was talking about. Um, as you know, both were saying we have to do this in a in a context of of climate change, and uh, and this is happening uh, now. So this is this is a look at uh, we have this for the whole African continent. This is just a look at temperature in Mozambique. And uh, it's it's just this decade, the, the 2020s, uh, and and climate relative to 1990. So this is <clears throat> called a box and whisker plot. And uh, uh, so we've got on the horizontal axis we've got temperature, and inside the box, the upper the the red box that's that's above is about 50 percent of of, um, of temperature outcomes. And uh, in the whiskers, within the whiskers is is the range of the distribution. So. Uh, typically won't go below the, the left hand uh, whisker and it won't go above the right hand whisker and the dots are, are outliers. Um, the blue line at the top just signifies that the climate was what it was in, in 1990. There, there isn't a, a, a variation on that. Um, in, the, in the 2020s, we don't know what climate is going to look like exactly. Uh, there could be just a little bit of warming, warming the, the blue on the, on the left hand side or there could be quite a bit more uh, warming and, and about 50% of outcomes are within the blue box. And so that's the range that we're looking at with, with, just, uh, with just climate. 
one of the new things that that we've done is just put weather on top of the the climate change. So when you when you add just uh, you know the fact that uh, weather is 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 variable, um, you know you don't know what what it's going to be like, uh, what the weather is going to be like on any given day, uh, and it could be hot or it could be cool. Uh, you add quite significantly to the range of of temperature with with a lot of really high uh, temperature outcomes. So this this really drives. Uh, uh, ev evaporation and it and it puts a lot of emphasis on on the on the water resources. Um, similarly, uh, we're looking at uh, a lot of uncertainty in what's going to happen to precipitation. So this is exactly the same uh, uh, type of graph, uh, box and whisker plot for precipitation in the in the 2020s, uh, and this is in the the main growing season, three months of the main growing season in in Mozambique. And, and what we're looking at is both the possibilities of when you add climate and weather of having either uh, much lower uh, precipitation than, than we would expect within the range, the range is getting bigger, or greater participation, uh, precipitation. And so this is both from the perspective of, of drought uh, and from the perspective of flood, uh, but it really puts the highlight on uh, the the water resources and and conserving water resources uh, and it, and it goes back to using your your hydropower resources as well as possible uh, so that you can practice the agriculture uh, and uh, you know uh, the, uh, in a climate smart way um, deploy irrigation and other methods that's going to help to to combat the the, the climate crisis. Uh, so those are the things that uh, I wanted to bring up in this uh, initial part, and uh, and and w I'm happy to move on to, to discussion. So back to you, uh, Salim. Uh, thank you, Channing. That was uh, really uh, fascinating, and thanks for illustrating the huge potential on the African continent for uh, building uh, renewable infrastructure and the manner in which it, it could be developed. So maybe if I can uh, <clears throat> just... Uh, I reflect on some of the questions that have been put forward. Uh, how do you uh, facilitate a just transition where in many cases where there, there's been coal and fossil economies, uh, workers have lost their jobs or are in danger of losing their jobs? Can renewables actually uh, create a new job opportunities? How do you make that happen? Again, Channing, you, you may want to respond to this. And uh, I have the two other questions that I thought uh, you may want to answer. And if you if you're okay, if I can just uh, uh, you know relay them to you. So the one question is actually from former Minister Rob Davies. Uh, I think you know him well. Uh, what might be a reimagined infrastructure development program that will help resilience resilience against extreme weather events and addresses vulnerabilities linked to squalid living conditions look like? So what is this reimagined infrastructure? Uh, I know it's a, it's a challenging question, but I, I thought you might have some thoughts. And there's a question around one of your, your slides, uh, a clarification. Uh, and this is with regard to renewables in, a, in, the, in the US. Could you please speak to the issue of renewables on the first graph showing the drop off of coal in the US? It seemed the renewables was tailing off too. Is this correct? And maybe just to uh, respond to those two and any other questions that, that uh, you feel uh, you can address. So over to you, Channing. OK, um, thanks very much. I'll take the renewables one first. Um, the drivers of the coal, of the declining coal, was initially natural gas. Uh, but that's come behind uh, now. It's There's a substantial increase in wind power and in, and in solar power, and that's been a, a big part of the driver. Uh, since that since that time, uh, so so those those are the main drivers we're seeing, you know, increases in renewable uh, use despite the fact that the Trump administration is is pushing coal. Uh, so even though they're pushing coal, we now have the lowest coal use in the U.S. in, in well since the data series began. I'm going to leave Rob Davies' question for for the end, so I, maybe I'll think about it as I'm talking. Um, uh, I think that Carlos did a great job of talking about the what you might call the macroeconomic space issue. Um, it's a it's a problem, obviously, just a, a lot more constrained. Uh, you know, the 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 Treasury just can't issue bonds and at negative interest rates. 
um, that that's not going to happen. So so you 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 confront these difficulties, and you, and he mentioned these higher interest rates that that are are paid uh, in in developing countries, and this has a big deal for for climate finance because. Um, most of these climate investments, I mean, uh, most of the cost of wind power or solar power, uh, hydropower even, uh, are right up front at the beginning. So the interest costs are, are, are really um, material. Uh, so, so the climate finance issue is, is something, you know, I spoke about this advantage in terms of endowments, and I think that's really important. Um, but at the same time, you have to come to grips with, with the finance issue. One of the issues that I think is really interesting that we haven't uh, delved into quite enough is if you think about traditional, for example, you know, a coal fired power plant will take um, seven to 10 years to build. And uh, and so, you know, you're obliged to be sitting there saying, OK, how much electricity are we going to need in seven to 10 years? And then you start building the coal fired power power plant today. Well, who knows how much electricity demand South Africa and, or any African country is, is going to need in, in seven to 10 years. This is really quite an issue. This is one of the reasons why um, you know, the continent as a whole started to brown out in about, about 2008, 9, 10, uh, because nobody back in 2000 really thought that the continent was going to grow at the rate that it actually did in the first decade of, of, the, of the 2000s. Um, renewables are different. Once you have a you know a solar farm or a wind farm, uh, you can relatively easily. They're quite modular. Within six months, you can add. So there there is the issue with renewables of trying to match supply and demand. You know, at a moment in time and at instantaneously. But in terms of being able to match supply with demand over, you know, as growth trajectories of the economy are going, uh, there's a big advantage there, and that and that uh, should should come back to to the consideration of how this could be financed and 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 the sovereign debt sorts of issues that come up. Um, uh, Carlos is actually is is absolutely correct uh, in terms of COVID-19, uh, the policies that that you, that are coming into place. Um, I mean, it, as you well know, I mean, it's a big deal. Uh, and there are a lot of short-term imperatives. Uh, there's no doubt that that globally uh, in Africa and Asia and elsewhere, food security is being threatened. And largely, you know, initially, it's it's just a consequence of, of reduced buying power, reduced earnings, uh, and and not and an inability to actually actually buy food. Uh, in South Africa, we've done some analysis, and and you know, government transfers are are helping helping quite a bit. Uh, so, so that's 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 an that's an important uh, point. But it goes back to the macro space point that, that Carlos brought up uh, at the beginning. You have to keep the that expenditure going, and you've got many many other uh, expenditure needs that you want to uh, take care of, and and you're going to have to find the the funding for that. It's just not an easy time at this point. Uh, in terms of renewables and jobs, I I agree completely with Tasneem. Uh, you know the 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 economy wide approach is 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 absolutely what what you need to do certainly in places where you have a number of of coal mines uh you know you're not in automatically going to get the jobs that that you that you want um i think there's been some really good work at uct looking at uh, because you basically a particular coal mine will feed a particular power plant. Uh, so you're going to know since you have a schedule for decommissioning of the coal fired plants, you're going to know which coal mine is affected. You know the age profile of workers and so forth. So you can you can do a fair amount of work uh, to get to what's what's happening there. And, and that's uh, that's been done. It, it's I think when you take it on the economy wide uh, perspective, uh, the, the, the renewables are slightly more labor intensive. So as you shift, you, you can generate uh, some jobs, uh, but you also get big effects if, if you, know, you, you have cheaper electricity, um, then you get the kind of industrialization, the shift towards manufacturers that, uh, that Carlos was talking about, and you create jobs. Uh, the other factor is right now, uh, if, if renewables are cheaper, uh, then uh, you, know, you don't need to uh, allocate as much of this precious capital that uh, Carlos was talking about uh, to to electricity generation. You can allocate capital to factories, other productive uh, assets, or or the infrastructure that um, that Rob Davies was was talking about. Um, I want to point out, and I think this is important, that you know we're looking at a just transition now and just transition uh, away from coal, and and that's very very important. Uh, it's it's what is there 
on the menu right at the at the moment. Um, <coughs> looking forward, if you're going to contain climate change, you're going to need a, a transition in transport as well, uh, and and uh, electrification of transport is is coming, uh, and and that is going to be a much much bigger uh, transition than than you know like, you know shifting from uh, coal fired generation of power to to renewable generation. And, you know, if you look in South Africa, it's going to affect the motor industry development program. It'll affect all retail sale of of, of fuel. Uh, it affects the whole you know distribution of fuel. It's going to affect every repair shop. Um, you know, maintenance of the internal combustion engine won't be won't be necessary if it's electrical. Uh, electric engines are incredibly reliable and don't don't really require. Uh, very much maintenance at all. So that's going to uh, affect a, a lot more jobs. And, and I think, um, you know, having your, your eyes open to that transition is going to be important. And, and it's also, I think, one of the reasons that you have this price war between uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, Russia, and, and others is there's a realization that we're just not going to burn all of the oil that we that we have. Uh, and, and, you know, if, especially if this is going to electrify. Uh, so places that that can produce cheaply, like Saudi Arabia, are are willing to to put the prices low to to force other producers out. And Africa is is not a, a low cost producer. So uh, Nigeria and Angola and others who are exporters uh, are going to be uh, feeling this this pinch um, for for quite some time. South Africa as an importer will 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 benefit from 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 the oil. Um, Reimagined infrastructure. Uh, and I think in particular, you need to think about the extreme events. Um, uh, uh, high heat will do things to, to, for example, the rail network. Um, in South Africa, you don't have to worry as much about the, the cyclones, and, but certainly you do in, in Mozambique. Um, uh, and, and a lot of it really uh, revolves around water. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the infra Building roads such that you know you're not on a 50-year floodplain uh, that might turn into a 10-year floodplain, for example. Um, in in South Africa, uh, the work that we did for the long-term adaptation strategies really emphasized the existing water infrastructure that South Africa has, and the, the ability to move water between basins uh, is incredibly important uh, for an uncertain climate future. Uh, and, and that's both in terms of being able to irrigate uh, in agriculture, but also making sure that municipal and industrial use isn't uh, isn't uh, disrupted. Uh, the, the only place uh, that that really doesn't have that capability is where it's gotten the driest is, is down around uh, Cape Town. You can't really there's it's too far to, to get across. But but up in, in around Johannesburg and uh, in the uh, northern and eastern sections, there's there's good ability to move water between basins and, and keeping that infrastructure. Uh, in place is is quite important. Um, I think you can also we're talking about a reimagined infrastructure in the form of of the energy infrastructure, and I I think that that's uh, very much in process. And I mean it's in it's in people's heads. Um, and and I think that uh, uh, looking forward, we want to take a regional perspective to that infrastructure. I think that will bring uh, well, it's a more robust system. And and it and it brings back uh, the the region, the Southern Africa region, as you know, potentially a very very low cost uh, electricity uh, with with a series of advantages for 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 jobs and and other other social developments. Um, so so I'll I'll leave it uh, there for that. Thanks. Back to Salim. So, um, Channing, uh, if I can ask you uh, maybe uh, three minutes or so, if you can make your final remarks, and then I'll try to round off. Yep. Sure. Um, thanks a lot. I'll just I'll just make a couple of points. I think uh, you know on the international institutional architecture. I think it was clear you know even two years ago, or it's been clear for for a while that that really we have an international institutional architecture that's a 20th century institutional architecture with 20 a lot of 20th century institutions, and these are are, are trapped in the in the 21st century. Uh, and there, there was always a, a lot of need for, for reform, governance of those institutions, the way it functions, the problems that it addresses, and 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 so forth. 
Um, and now with with the, the COVID crisis, I think you've, you've exposed that even more. I think it was Carlos that brought up the point about trade in uh, uh, protective equipment as well as reagents. Uh, and, and how that was that was disrupted quite quickly. And obviously that's going to come and factor into people's uh, decision to trade and other things like food, for example. Um, that, that's also quite critical. Uh, and, and you know what kind of security do you have if, if you if you're going to rely on international markets that can become you know very fickle uh, the moment uh, a, a crisis comes into into existence. And that's that's something that, that also the international community will have to um, deal with. The second area is just in renewable energy infrastructure. And I think you, know, you have two phrases in English, one bigger is better and small is beautiful. And with renewable energy, it's both. Uh, you know, uh, I've emphasized a little bit the, the big grids, um, the regional trade, um, and, and I think you do need that for lighting Johannesburg and Durban and Lusaka and, and, and the industrial sectors and, and so forth. At the same time, Tasneem has, has uh, emphasized um, you know, mini grids and, and community based energy generation. And that, that also is a tremendous opportunity uh, for, for particularly uh, places that are, that are a long way from grids or, or have other reasons that they, they want to generate their, their own power. And, and there's, a, there's a ton of opportunity there. Um, so, so I think uh, that's, that's, uh, that's very important. Um, and, and both of those apply in renewable energy brings, brings both of those opportunities.